So I'd like to introduce our moderator today. Uh, this gentleman to my right is Adrian Benepee. He first worked for the Department of Parks at age 16, and after college became one of the first urban park rangers. Over the next three decades, he headed up communications, natural resources, art and antiques for the department, and was eventually appointed Parks Commissioner by Mayor Bloomberg in 2002. Adrian left that position just last month to become Senior VP of City Park Development for the Trust for Public Land, a national preservation group. So please say hello to Adrian Benefit. <laughs> to Adrian's right is Thomas Beller. He's the author of two works of fiction, Seduction Theory, The Sleepover Artist, and an essay collection called How to Be a Man. He was a founder and editor of Open City Magazine and of the literary website devoted to New York City nonfiction called Mr. Beller's Neighborhood. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Best American Short Stories, and other publications. And he's at work now on a biography of J.D. Salinger. We would like you to come back for that, Thomas, when that's ready. And he teaches at Tulane University. So please say hello to Thomas. <laughs> to Thomas's right is uh, Buzz Bissinger, who is a Pulitzer Prize winner and the author of the American classic Friday Night, Night Lights also the author of Prayer for the City, Three Nights in August, and fought his most recent and most personal work, Father's Day, A Journey into the Mind and Heart of My Extraordinary Son. Buzz is a contributing editor at Vanity Fair and the sports columnist for the Daily Beast. And in June, he began the Buzz Visitor Show with Steve Martirano, did I pronounce that? Excellent. Correctly, which debuted at 1210 WPHT in Philadelphia. And another special thing about Buzz, he's actually coming back here on Friday, November 9th, to talk about the great Mickey Mantle. <laughs> so we hope you'll come back. Say hello to Buzz. Thank you. Thank you. To my right, of course, is the wonderful Mayor Ed Koch, who was mayor of New York from 1978 to 1990. During his tenure, he restored fiscal stability to the city of New York. And he was a seminal figure in the formation of the Central Park Conservancy, which, as you know, is an organization critically important to the, hearts, to the park's well-being and history. Currently, Mayor Koch is a partner in the law firm of Brian Cave, LLP, and he can be heard on, heard on Bloomberg Radio and seen on New York One, where he shares the stage with Senator Al D'Amato. He's also the author of numerous books, including Giuliani, Nasty Man, <laughs> <laughs> and the Koch Papers, My Fight Against Anti-Semitism, and many others. Uh, this program coincides with the publication of this wonderful book, uh, called Central Park and Anthology. It is edited by Andrew, Andrew Blauner, who is here with us today. Our editor is here as well. Um, and Andrew has lived most of his life within two blocks of Central Park. So everybody who's contributed to this book, including Buzz and Thomas and Adrian, did the introduction, um, is in love with this park, and it shows in their work. So this is for sale if you'd like to buy it, and some of our panels will sign after the talk. Um, and a portion of the editor proceeds go to the conservancy, so it's for a good cause also. Anyway, enough of me. Please welcome Adrian Thomas Buzz and Mayor Koch. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and it's a great pleasure to be here at the 92nd Street Wide. Let me thank Debbie Himmelfarb for having us here today. Um, it's funny to say at the 92nd Street Y because it's not on 92nd Street. It's 92nd Street Y Tribeca here in the triangle below Canal Street, and I want to thank um, Andrew Blauner for working with Debbie to put this together. Um, Andrew has put together, speaking of put together, has put together a wonderful series of essays about Central Park in, in the most personal way, and you're going to hear from two of the authors whose um, pieces appear in it, um, and also from the men, you know, it can safely be said, without whom Central Park's restoration would not have happened, and he, he may speak a little bit about that. Um, just briefly, I, I will serve as moderator, but I have a, a lifetime affiliation with Central Park, starting as a child visiting the park, but then um, working in the park in a variety of capacities, including as a illegal vendor in the summer of 1976, um, when things you could do a lot of illegal things and nobody cared, um, and then being on the other side of the law in 1979, when Mayor Koch was mayor, he appointed a terrific parks commissioner, Gordon Davis. Gordon Davis thought that we ought to try to restore some order to the parks, and one of the first things he did was create an urban park ranger program. And in the spring of 1979, 33 and a half years ago, he hired a bunch of young and mostly idealistic New Yorkers to become park rangers, 
and I was one of those park rangers, so there I was enforcing the rules in <laughs> Central Park. And uh, it was the beginning of a, a wonderful career for me in the city, which I ended up being eventually appointed parks commissioner after many years in the parks department. But I owe my, the beginning, I owe my entire career to that beginning launched uh, under under Mayor Koch by his brilliant, I still think the best parks commissioner of the last 50 years, Gordon Davis, who many great innovations happened. And so I'd like to, um, I'd like to start with the mayor, uh, not just because he was my boss, uh, and a terrific mayor, and who led th not just the renaissance of Central Park, but the renaissance of New York City. We, I ask you to go back in time to the mid-1970s, to the terrible fiscal crisis, to the, um, the end of a long period of decline in New York City when even Central Park was sort of a munici municipal embarrassment and a worldwide symbol for the decline of cities in a sense that cities may not be livable anymore. This is the world that Mayor Koch stepped into, that he the park system he inherited. And if you can imagine Central Park being a disaster, the rest of the parks were even worse. And he had to do a lot very fast. And one of the first things he did was <coughs> appoint a young, a very young man, I think he was, might have even been in his 30s, certainly his early 40s, named Gordon Davis to be parks commissioner. And I'll start there. Mayor, uh, t tell, me, tell us about some of your memories of Central Park and the things that helped, what, what you did to help bring Central Park back and by extension the rest of the park system. Uh, when I came in, uh, Central Park and other parks uh, similarly were situated was a sandlot. The uh, um, sheep meadow, uh, the major areas of the uh, park hadn't been reseeded and returfed, whatever the technical expression uh, is. Uh, and they, uh, it was really scandalous, scandalous. And interestingly, I remember a poll taken at the time, which was, uh, what are your priorities of the public here in New York? And parks came out as a priority. I mean, it was a shocker. But parks was, or were, uh, the priority of the citizens of New York. Central Park is unique. We, I mean, every borough has uh, its uh, own major park as well as smaller parks. But Central Park uh, is unique in the uh, eyes and the hearts of all uh, New Yorkers. Now, um, before uh, we started, uh, uh, Adrian uh, said he was going to ask me my most prominent memory of the park. And um, it's easy. Simon Garfunkel, uh, one of the things that uh, Gordon Davis did was to invite a major uh, attractions like Simon Garfunkel and Diana Ross and a whole host of others, and you had the, the Metropolitan Opera. They all performed free of charge uh, in uh, the park, and they made their money by recording it and then selling it. And we made some money on it, and not uh, such a small sum, um, by renting the land, but it wasn't for money. It was to provide unique entertainment uh, for the people of the city of uh, New York. And uh, 500,000 people could come to a concert. I think that was the number. I'm not really sure uh, for Simon Garfunkel. The largest number that came was a demonstration against uh, the hydrogen bomb. 800,000 people uh, came uh, to Central Park. But what I did uh, when uh, people uh, would come for the entertainment, and they would come and spread uh, their uh, uh, rugs and towels and uh, on the ground and uh, picnic. And I would come from the inner highway of the uh, park, so I'd be at the rear of uh, this crowd. And then I would jump from, uh, from group to group, and they'd all invite me to come and have <laughs> Uh, wine and cheese. I mean, it was uh, an extraordinary event. But the event that uh, is in my mind, the one I want to tell you about, was the Simon and Garfunkel one, where uh, 
the mayor has the privilege of coming out and introducing the uh, performers. And I said to myself, it was one of the smartest things I ever did in my whole life. I said to myself, if I do what every mayor before me undoubtedly did and would do now, which is to make a speech, they'll throw things. <laughs> and uh, you can, must never get in between the entertainers uh, and the crowd, never, for, except for a fraction of a second. And so I walked out on the stage, everybody's expecting a boring uh, statement from the mayor, he's gonna tell you what he's done for you <laughs> in the last uh, week. And instead, from me, they got, ladies and gentlemen, Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> and I'm now on their record. I opened the record. <laughs> you, um, that was a, one of the high moments of, uh, of your career and what happened in New York City. And I think, in, in a way, that concert was sort of a a signal that New York was back. And um, you know, it, it, it sticks in a lot of our consciousness as this sort of great, wonderful time, and Central Park was safe again, you could be there with people. But yeah, a lot of hard work went on behind the scenes, and the, uh, the whole concept of a public-private partnership where a group of, a board of trustees of prominent private citizens would get involved with the life of a park and raise money for it the way they would for a college or university or hospital or a museum. That was born, that whole concept was born in, in your administration. Um, that was the brainchild of Gordon. Yeah, but you, you appointed this woman, Betsy Barlow, to be the first administrator of Central Park, and then she, cre she worked with George Soros and Dick Gilder and Arthur Ross to create the Central Park Conservancy. But you had to take a leap of faith that this was okay. Why, why did you do that? Uh, because I was convinced uh, that uh, when Gordon brought the concept uh, to me, um, and uh, asked me to approve it because what we were doing uh, was uh, turning over uh, major responsibilities uh, to a conservancy, uh, very wealthy people <laughs> for the most part, who would be raising money for the park, millions of dollars. Uh, I assume by this time it's hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, uh, there was only one thing uh, that uh, I wouldn't do that I uh, was asked at the time, and that was they wanted to uh, make the appointments internally. And I said, nothing doing. I'm still the mayor, and I'll decide who's on that board. You'll tell me who you want, and I'll take them, but I'll make that decision. I mean, I never believe that the mayor should give up real authority. So uh, that's the way uh, we actually uh, did it. I don't know how they do it now. They probably appoint themselves, but <laughs> do you know? They, they still, the mayor still appoints five board members, but the most important thing is the, the city still sets the policy. That the, the administrator of Central Park, who also oversees the conservancy, has to report to the Parks Commissioner and cannot make independent policy decisions. So you established the precedent of mayoral authority over what happens in the park and it continues to this day. And I think it's key to making sure that the public interest is always maintained. Any, um, any memories of things that weren't so great in Central sure. Park? Sure, was another concert, was the Diana Ross concert. Uh, Gordon Davis picked the people and of course she was a magnificent figure at the time. And, um, and we were all looking forward to a terrific concert. Um, and uh, it attracted, as would uh, be normal, a large number of uh, minority uh, spectators who normally didn't come uh, to these major uh, productions, but they did. Diana Ross, she was a great figure in the minority community. And uh, uh, it uh, uh, suddenly rained, stormed, and and there she's on the stage. She doesn't want to leave. I mean, it was great heart, so to speak, and she's dancing and singing, and it's buckets coming down, and uh, the rest of us are out there. There's no protection. You're out in the elements and so forth. But finally, it had uh, to end. But uh, that night... Um, 
a new word was born in the city of New York, wilding. And uh, I'd never heard of it, and neither had most people. But uh, there were uh, literally dozens, maybe hundreds, but dozens of uh, altercations and muggings and so forth. I mean, it was actually a disgrace uh, that occurred uh, at the time. It shamed uh, the people of the city of New York, all of us. Uh, and then she came back the next night, and I was there too. But the, also the first night, um, somebody threw a brick at me. And uh, I was very lucky, because I was in a section of dignitaries, so to speak. And um, suddenly, and there, Gordon was there with uh, a uh, park supervisor. Henry was the commissioner. He inherited the concert from oh, Gordon. Oh, was it Henry? So Henry had just st but, uh, he had but, started like weeks before. But Gordon yeah. was there at that Gordon very moment too, yeah. uh, when, the, when this happened. He may not have been the commissioner, but he was there. And um, suddenly, a brick came flying over, and it would have hit me in the head. Uh, who knows what would have happened? Uh, and the supervisor jumped up and grabbed it. Wow. I was very, very lucky. So um, I'm going to use that and I'm going to do a little bit of a segue. I, I was there that night. I was there both nights. It rained out the first night. The second night was a beautiful, warm night, and then they had all the troubles after the second night. I'll tell you a funny anecdote and use that to segue over to our writers is um, there was a press conference on Monday that Henry Stern had to do to sort of explain what had happened, why things had gone wrong, why people had been mugged. <clears throat> and people were trying to, the press, and the press never does this, the press at the time were trying to turn it into a racial thing when it had been you know, a few hundred kids who had ruined it for tens of thousands of people. And um, a, a reporter says to the Parks Commissioner, and this press conference is 90 degrees, says, you know, Commissioner, um, you had a James Taylor concert, 500,000 people, no problems. You had Elton John, 500,000 people, no problems. You had uh, Barbara Streisand, 600,000 people, no problems. Why was this concert different from all the others? And I'm thinking, oh God, how does he answer this? And Henry looks and he says, ah, the Passover question. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what happened, this very tense press conference. The people who got it laughed. The people who didn't get it, they knew some joke had gone over their heads. <laughs> but he had diffused the tension. And this is when I knew I was working for a brilliant man. Um, anyway, speaking of brilliant people, you guys probably have your own memories of those days. Like me, you grew up in the uh, Central Park. That was a very different park than it is now. It was, a, it was very edgy. Uh, a lot of, there were a thousand serious crimes every year in Central Park. There are now fewer than 50. And those serious crimes are primarily they're called serious, but they're just people who leave their backpacks on a bench and then come back and it's gone. You know, that's, so it's a felony because the credit cards were in the purse. So there's virtually no serious crime, except they did have a, a, a rape recently, but that's extremely unusual. And you have 38 million visits a year to Central Park. So there's virtually no crime, relatively speaking, compared to almost any other precinct. But every crime is a terrible crime. But when we were younger, when we were, teenagers roaming the park, you did have a thousand serious crimes. There were murders, there were rapes, there were, the buildings were abandoned, and you had to be careful where you went. This is the park that uh, I'm assuming we all grew up in, but, and yet we still have the park. So I guess I'll start with Buzz. Let's talk about your memories of the park. Well, I, uh, um, I was born in New York City in 1954. My parents in 1957 moved to 88th Street and Center Park West and had this absolutely magnificent view of Central Park. And rather, I think it's probably best just to read from what I wrote a little bit, because I think it gives uh, the sense. Uh, I have always loved the park. I now live in Philadelphia, but I consider myself a New Yorker. And I'd really like to thank Mayor Koch, not only for the amazing work that he did on behalf of the park, and the wonderful phrase, how am I doing? Um, but also for sitting, because he's actually quite tall, and I always thought you were short because you had that kind of feistiness that most, uh, most mayors have. You were a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful positive influence on the city, and I think you, you proved to me, because I later wrote a book about the mayor of Philadelphia, Ed Rundell, you proved to me that, that energy, spirit, and hope are essential because without hope and optimism, there is nothing, and you changed the attitude of New Yorkers into this is what we can do. So I really appreciate all your efforts, and I'm flattered to be with you um, 
today. Anyway, I always fell in love with the park. Um, it was special, it was magnificent, it was dangerous. There were all sorts of stories that you could not walk across it after five o'clock. I was very conscious of the fact that it was falling apart, that it was sand. But I also remember as being a young kid with my father, we would um, you know, walk the great circle and the, the, these marvelous, marvelous softball games uh, between uh, Puerto Rican teams where they argued over every pitch. Uh, but they were marvelous uh, to watch. The park always, always had this very special energy to me. But let me just read a little bit, um, if I can see here. Looking down in the Central Park was like inserting yourself into the best soul of the city that in the 60s was convulsing with garbage strikes and teacher strikes and race riots. My mother loved Mayor John Lindsay. I think every woman over the age of five loved John Lindsay. Come to think of it, so did every man. He was handsome and passionate and articulate, but as a mayor, the city simply swallowed him and sank further and further into decline. Maybe in retrospect, he should have been a porn star. <laughs> For much of that period, Central Park seemed to be the only place that held hope, however wobbly because of, of its dilapidation. Buildings rose and fell and rose again in the ever-shifting city, even during the difficult times. Mayors came and went, the great disappointment of Lindsay giving way to the oddly enduring impish, impishness of Abe Beam in the 1970s and then Ed Koch in the 1980s. Until then, there was little sustained consistency, the sense that the city could still explode at any second. But Central Park stayed as it was to me, or mostly as it was. It was badly in need of a haircut and a shave. Garbage cans needed to be emptied more than once a year. And the dangers of the park at night became manna for the New York Daily News and the New York Post. But Central Park was still the greatest, single greatest city planning feat of New York and perhaps of any city in the world. It also became the one egalitarian place in Manhattan, young next to old, aimless next to ambitious, homeless wearing the Sunday New York Times next to the nobility of Fifth Avenue reading the New York Times. I often wondered what it would be like if they switched. And that's what the park was. It was egalitarian. You, I think it's one of the reasons that I became a writer. This, this, the sights, the sounds, the smells, all sorts of different senses uh, hitting you um, at all times. Um, my relationship with the park also became very, very bittersweet. I live in Philadelphia, but I consider myself a New Yorker because my parents uh, lived in the city until they, uh, 2002. So I came back a lot. They lived in the same apartment for over uh, 40 years. And I always loved uh, to linger in the living room and just look out into the green of the park and um, across into Fifth Avenue and always wondered what those naughty girls from Beerley were doing that I couldn't <laughs> quite see. Um, sadly, my parents died uh, back, back to back uh, in 2001 and 2002. Uh, my mother died after my father. She had dementia, but even then, the moments she loved the best, and she loved New York. She, um, she loved New York. My parents had run a, uh, ran a municipal bond firm called Labenthal and & Company. And we would take her in a wheelchair, and we would take her to one of the park benches, and there would always be one of those great hot dog stands um, the best hot dogs in the world until you thought about what might be in them. Um, and she would sit, and we would sit in between her, and she would always have her two hot dogs. And I really felt at that moment that she knew where she was, and she knew what she was, which was a New Yorker. And once she died, it was a rent control apartment, and uh, we could not keep it. And I, this is not apocryphal, I was the last to leave and you go through all the, the rooms and they're empty now and it's, it's, they're, it's like a ghost town. And remember lingering in the, the living room and looking one more time at the park with my parents gone and knowing that this place, this icon of the world would simply never ever be mine again. 
Thank you. Thomas, um, you uh, again. We have in common this park, and I think the the great thing about this park and many other parks is that we New Yorkers, particularly Manhattan residents, don't have a front yard or backyard. <clears throat> um, if you're very lucky, you might have a little terrace someplace or a little garden behind a townhouse. But um, the parks, Riverside Park, Central Park, whatever park, now Hudson River Park, are literally our front yards and backyards. And they play a role much more important in my estimation than simply a park. They're, they become, or have become, in a way, secular churches or synagogues, places where people go when they want to be with people in a time of stress. And I remember in particular um, the day of 9-11, the very afternoon of 9-11, um, the smoke pouring, the buildings just collapsed, and the column of smoke drifting uptown. For those of you who lived in Manhattan, remember the smoke came north. I went out to the Sheep Meadow, and people, the young people who gathered in the Sheep Meadow were gathering in the Sheep Meadow. And I was thinking to myself at first, how could they do this? There are people in a, this charnel fire downtown. How can they just come out to the Sheep Meadow? And I realized they needed to, to come to the Sheep Meadow. They needed that reaffirmation that life still goes on, that we were together. And I remember that same thing the night that John Lennon died. Everybody poured into Central Park. Thousands of people gathered by the band shell in Central Park as if this were our St. Paul's Cathedral. And I think for many people, parks are places where they have weddings and they have ceremonies and they have sweet 16 parties. You go there to be very happy with people, but you also go there during times of great municipal sadness. They're a gathering place. And so that the, the everyone has a personal relationship with parks. And I think you could, <clears throat> there are probably everyone in this audience can say, that bench, this place, this carousel horse, <clears throat> that corner, this rock, I had some or many important moments in my life take place in Central Park. Are there such things for you, Thomas? Yes, and uh, you know, I was going to just read a couple of paragraphs that it just so happened speak to this um, idea of sort of the park as sanctuary. So let me get that out of the way and then we can chat. Um, so this is from a piece called Negative Space. If you grow up in New York City, or maybe just Manhattan, as I did, you become a connoisseur of negative space. For hardcore city files, I mean the people who allow for the texture and topography of the city to enter in their soul. These spaces are refuges, tiny oases sought after multi-purpose. They are meditative temples they are moments of rest. There's so much action in New York, one is sometimes perversely excited by those places where you are not part of it, where nothing is happening. These places in turn become little pockets of possibility. They are unidentified, off the grid, the staging areas for trysts, seductions, encounters. They are the places where crimes are committed of one kind or another. The most conspicuous hiding in plain sight negative space in New York is Central Park. There were four of us, the West Side Freaks. Worth and I lived on Riverside Drive. John and Adrian lived on Central Park West. We attended a private school in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. Most of the kids in our school were ferried to, to school from Manhattan on private bus lines that picked everyone up at various points and then rumbled through Harlem across the 133rd Street Bridge, up the Major Deegan, past the Stelladoro cookie factory with its useful clock on top and its fleeting whiff of sweetness, and at last into the verdant cloistered world of Riverdale. There were something like seven or eight buses that ran up the various east side avenues. The west side had two, one for Central Park West and one for West End. We were west side kids. Well, uh, the next sentence is so relevant to what I want to chat about. I'll just throw that out there too. Uh, Excuse me. I now look at my whole generation from that school, the rich, the sort of rich and not so rich kids of private school Manhattan circa the 1970s and early 80s as a group that had OD'd on affluence, safety and prosperity. Also, despite a serious crime wave and depletion of city services, we were undoubtedly the last generation of kids who were allowed to roam around the city with relative autonomy. 
without the specter of Amber Alerts and 24-7 coverage of every abducted or missing young person in America, stoking parental paranoia, fantasy, and guilt. I'll stop there. Um, can I ramble on? <laughs> Talking about this book, and this is, I've done a few events in connection with it, it's really struck me how, although Central Park is the occasion for all of the essays, you can almost retitle the book and not change any of its contents and make it a book about childhood in New York. Because many of the most compelling essays are instances of not just recounting what happened, but trying to make sense of the distance between the then and the now, with Central Park as the sort of measuring stick of change and of time. And one thing that's really struck me is the generations in the book span a couple of decades. You've got people whose childhood took place in the 60s or late 60s, as we just heard from a little bit, and people who, whose childhood took place is maybe even in the early 90s. But in my mind, in a funny way, they, they all form a continuum and fall into a kind of before, and now we look at it from an after, and things have changed. And from strictly the park's point of view, I think you can safely say it changed very, very much for the better. And we've heard about some of the mechanics of how that happened, and I know I'm grateful for that change. I love being in Central Park. But I must say, having been part of these um, readings or events with the book, in which Central Park is referred to with so much reverence and love, as, as Debbie Himmelfarb said, a place that we all love. I don't know, some contrary gene within me is starting to get an, uh, find some problematic aspect of this, shall we say, because um, while well, as the commissioner was just talking about, he went from, in 1979, enforcing rules, but just a few years earlier, you know, uh, violating the rules, and he didn't seem enormously pennant when he was talking about the 1976 <laughs> self that he was. And one of the things that I often mull over, and I in a way want to open this conversation up for everybody here, in particular the mayor, who by the way, I, I just ditto ever, all of the words that Buzz Bissinger said, because, uh, and uh, very excited to be here with you and grateful for the work you've done. But one thing that's really struck me in, in the conversations around this book is, as great as it is that Central Park is so beautiful and well-maintained now, um, things have changed in the city, and it doesn't seem like it's an explicitly, unilaterally positive change. And one thing in particular, maybe it's an urban myth, but I'm under the impression there's a quote from our current mayor. It's a number of years old now. But it really struck me when I heard it, and it went something like this. And again, this is not, uh, this is not a fact-checked quote, but uh, my understanding was something to the effect of, you know, New York, New York is a luxury, and you have to pay a premium for luxury. As in, this is a very beautiful place, it's a very special place, and it's cost a lot of money to be here. So, and I just am not entirely sure how I felt about that, and I remain a little bit ambivalent uh, about that notion because as problematic from a sort of sociological point of view as the park may have been before Gordon Davis, Mayor Koch, Commissioner Benepe did the amazing work that's brought us to this moment, it wasn't without its virtues, including the anarchy, including the fact that it was a scary place. In my own piece, there's a lot of um, sort of darting in and out of the park as a kid, as a sort of daring of fate, um, which I don't think everyone should have that opportunity. You can dare, f you don't have to travel that far to dare fate in current New York City. Nevertheless, I just, uh, after hearing how much we all love Central Park in its current form over and over again, I'm starting to think, well, now wait one second, let's not whitewash it and make it be, it was all bad then and now the grass is, is green and we're happy. It's, there's something else going on as well. Thank you. I think what we'll do is I'm going to ask um, Tom and, and Buzz and Mayor Koch to uh, offer some final comments, and in about f six minutes, we'll throw up some questions. Uh, I will tell you, one thing I missed from the old days is there, and I mentioned this in the introduction to the book, which if you buy, you can read, is there were, it seemed to me, and maybe because there were fewer people there, there were more characters, as in uh, colorful characters, people who went to the park and didn't really live in the park, they lived elsewhere, but they effectively lived in the park, and they did their shtick in the park. They came to the park to sort of perform 
One of them, uh, well, Adam Purple was well known. He cycled around in his purple tie-dyed outfit and his purple bicycle collecting horse manure for his garden down the Lower East Side. And for a while, there was Eve Purple with him. Um, and then there was this other guy who had these uh, <coughs> very elaborate tropical birds. And the birds would be on bicycles and red wagons. He'd pull them behind him and stop and have people take pictures of him. Um, and those, uh, it, maybe the park is so... It's so busy now. It's so full of tourists. You can't see the characters. They're just, they're lost because there's literally 20,000 tourists with their J. Crew bags walking through the park. Um, so I miss the, I miss the characters. Um, thoughts, Mayor Koch? Well, what I uh, particularly love about the park is that you can buy a bench. I didn't know about that uh, until much after it had occurred, and I read it somewhere, and I said, well, I want to have a bench. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, now, sorry. Uh, just to repeat a little bit, uh, you can buy a bench in the park. And uh, I bought one. I bought one on the West Lawn, uh, and uh, I don't know if it's still the same price. It's probably gone up for $6,500. You have a choice at those days. $6,500 for... Uh, you know, a line of benches, and you get one of them, and uh, they put it in a bronze uh, uh, tablet. Uh, or you could have a single bench in a very distinguished area, like behind the uh, Metropolitan Museum. That was $25,000, which was a little too rich. So I bought the $6,500 uh, one, and, and then you're allowed a phrase. I, uh, it was the first tweet. I, they, they limit you. Uh, <laughs> And uh, my phrase, uh, as, as I recall, it was something like this, come sit with me and let us watch the grass grow. Not bad. Um, so once again, uh, there's something special, mystical about uh, Central Park. And uh, the fact is that it's known <laughs> throughout the world. I mean, you go to any um, capital and uh, talk with anybody about uh, uh, parks, they all know about Central Park. Buzz, uh, Tom, we'll give you, this is like we're, we're getting warmed up for the debate tonight. We'll give you your 30 second closing thought and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the floor. 30 seconds is loose. Yeah, I think it sounds like Tom liked it better when the 47% still lingered more in the park. Um, I understand what Tom is saying, and I think it's really a problem of the city. I think New York has become complete, Manhattan is completely gentrified. Um, and there is something about the park, it's almost too beautiful now, if that makes any sense. And I think New York has lost, frankly, uh, a, lot of its, a lot of its character. I n never felt, I don't think, tempted by fate in Central Park, except maybe this was your idea. Someone put in a dog run on 88th Street, and it became the New York equivalent of dodging landmines in Kosovo. Um, but I did always love the park. Often I went with my father. We didn't go at night. But there was something about it where I did not feel threatened. And, you know, on the west side in the 1960s, uh, it could be a threatening uh, place. But I understand New York has lost. I'm one of the few people in the world who thought what they did to Times Square was terrible. As a kid... As, as bad as it was, as illicit as it was, as dangerous as it was, cities need places like that where you are just smacked with every possible sight, sound, smell, and sense possible. And I think Tom is saying that also uh, about the park. It does smack of a, uh, the, the statues are a little too clean. They're a little too in bronze. And, and, you know, in bronze. The grass is, is, looks like a golf course. But what's great about the park is where it is. I mean, that's what makes it magnificent, the idea that Olmsted would build a park smack in them, really, in the middle of the city. So it is endearing to me, and it's obviously personal to me, really because of the connection my parents had to it, and really to my mother. As I said, I felt it was her last conscious moment that I am a New Yorker, and this is the place I want to be, and it may have been on the park bench that Mayor Koch bought. So. Um, just as a quick aside, Buzz, I don't think you're in such a minority about Times Square in New York City, maybe outside of New York City, but I wanted to, just in my 
uh, 30 seconds without the aid of a teleprompter, throw something again back at the mayor um, and ask you just if you have any comment at all about that, I thought, provocative remark of our Mayor Bloomberg that New York is a luxury and you need to pay a premium for luxury. What do you make of a statement like that, with the caveat that I might even be imagining the statement? But I, I think that <laughs> he said that, if not verbatim, something very close to New York is a luxury, and you know you have to pay a premium for that. So, so but live. I, I, live I think it. he had a 64-ounce soda when he said that. Yeah. <laughs> shall I shall I answer that? You know, there are very few cities in the country uh, that have a city income tax. I think it's warranted. Because of all the things that the city government does here in New York, not done anywhere else in the country, and keeping up the parks as we do keep them up, being one of them and a uh, major one. So it isn't uh, that the uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who I think has been a terrific mayor, is an elitist. Uh, there's no question he's very rich. <laughs> but what he is saying, these things don't come cheap and they don't come free. Somebody's got to pay for them. And there are basics uh, that uh, uh, people who are rich won't pay for. I mean, they'll pay for something that they like, like the conservancy. Uh, I mean, and I'm not knocking them. I mean, it, it, it ain't bad to be rich. I mean, uh, I don't put those people down. They do a very good job in most uh, cases. Uh, but I think that's what he was referring to, that somebody's got to pay for it. It doesn't come on trees. <laughs> I just want to draw attention to the phrase, those people, which I think is a great, very New York formulation to address the rich. Leave it at that. Oh, well, we do that about the poor. Somebody, Romney, no? Huh? <laughs> so, and um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions now and just because I have the prerogative to offer a, f a final thought, having worked on the government side for the better part of the last 33 years, I'd say all things being equal, I prefer the fixed up Central Park to the rundown Central Park, even if it's a little bit too perfect at times. And we should never take for granted that it is fixed up and that people of their own free will reach into their pockets and raise 25 or $30 million a year in private private donations to take care of the park. The city only provides four or five million dollars a year. So it's, it's quite extraordinary and we should never take it for granted. If they were to walk away and say, you know, I'm not feeling appreciated enough, Mount Sinai needs me, Columbia University needs me, the law school, the, this disease, the park could quickly go back to the old days. And I, wouldn't, I don't think any of us would want to see that. And then with that goes the tax base and so on. Uh, people, it's, it's well known that people are attracted to safe, attractive parks and will pay a premium to live near them. And then that provides jobs and so on. So on the whole, bad park, good park, I go with good park. Let's throw it open. Question in the back. And I'll repeat the question so people can hear it. Thinking about the park and what was possible, thinking ahead. And I'm curious to see 
question really addressed to the two of you and the challenges, and maybe the Gates is the best example, of how you uh, move within the park forward or think forward when so many are holding on to the past in the very nostalgic sense of their childhood, what the park was to them when you're trying to, uh, in government, think ahead and bear tamper with things that are a place that is held so um, <coughs> fervently by those who, for better or worse, are holding on to the sandlot uh, of, our, of their childhood. So the question is, um, I, I think if I can just make, make it succinct, a, a lot of um, people are looking backwards and saying, uh, I like the park the way it was, or um, the park had a certain, a certain nostalgia to it. And what do we, those of us who are working in government, um, the mayor and, and I, um, what do we do about thinking toward the future, and can you do that? And I will tell you, I will answer first, then turn it over to the mayor. Uh, the Gates project, uh, which I also write about in my introduction, um, I think the Gates was to the Bloomberg administration what the Simon and Garfunkel concert was to the Koch administration. Both of them came uh, against the backdrop of a New York that had been in deep trouble. In the, in the case of the, of the Simon and Garfunkel, it was reaffirming New York as a safe gathering place and the parks as a place to go after the depths of the fiscal crisis. In the case of the Gates, let's remember that was just a short time after 9-11. The city Many people said, can cities in general still be places to live, and in particular, New York? And we needed something to reaffirm that not only would New York survive, but it would thrive. <clears throat> I had a, a very interesting perspective, but when I worked for uh, Mayor Koch's second parks commissioner, Henry Stern, and his first parks commissioner, Gordon Davis, they spent 20 years telling Christo and Jean-Claude why they couldn't do the gates in Central Park. In fact, Gordon Davis published a 150-page epic book to turn down the gates when it was first proposed. Uh, when I was interviewed to be a uh, possible parks commissioner, the interview panel said, what do you think about the gates? And it quickly became clear to me that this was not a question, that they wanted to see, somehow see that the gates would happen. So it was my job to see if I could make it happen without hurting the park, and thank goodness, I worked with Christo and Jean-Claude and their brilliant engineer, Vince Davenport, and the key moment came when they said, you know, we don't have to dig 30,000 holes in the park, as we had said we had to do 25 years ago. We can put the gates on heavy duty weights that will sit on the asphalt paths, and there will be no damage done to the park, and we'll do it at a different time of year when the birds aren't migrating, so there won't be any environmental issues. So we're gonna make this a pain-free thing. Once they could do that, we could say yes. And it turned out to be magical, absolutely magical, and, um, I had been very skeptical about it, and in the middle of February, shortly after 9-11, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people came out to the park. Uh, millions of people, tourists flocked to New York. The hotels were full. S the Starbucks ran out of cups. <laughs> and um, this magical two weeks, which then became, I believe, a beginning of resurgence of tourism and a resurgence of belief in New York. To me, it was very interesting because I knew Central Park very well. And what it did was, these lines of orange flags follow the, all the paths, and because they were following the paths, they followed the undulations of the landscape and made very clear in a very uh, visible way that Central Park is not flat, that it has contours, it has hills and valleys, and all of these were as if a giant had come along with an hi orange highlighter pen and drawn the contour lines of Central Park on these paths, and for the first time you saw in a very visual way, <coughs> if you couldn't see it in the landscape, the drama of the Olmsted and Vox landscape that was created in Central Park. So from a landscape architect point of view, it was a very magical time. Uh, um, Gates came up during my administration, and I always believed uh, that unless you knew more than the commissioner on a particular item, you do what the commissioner proposes and suggests, or you get another commissioner. That was my philosophy. So. Uh, and I think it's the right philosophy. It, you put some money in charge, let them do what they want uh, to do. And uh, Gordon, who is a spectacular person, um, said uh, that he did not want to have uh, the, uh, uh, the gates for the reasons that uh, Adrian has told you. And I went along uh, with that. I was sorry about that because I had read about all the wonderful things that Christopher and his wife 
had done, uh, you know, they had uh, bandaged the Bundestag and uh, um, they were working on the Colorado River and God knows what. I mean, there were so many things and I envied it. I thought it would be wonderful for the city, but Gordon didn't want it. Uh, Gordon didn't want another thing. Uh, and that was at Quasi Mansion, uh, I wanted to put up a tent so we could uh, attract a lot of uh, the government people. I believed always in having uh, the opportunity of, made available to city people, employees of the city uh, who work so hard that they should be honored and bring them in and have dinners and places uh, uh, the, where the public ordinarily wouldn't be, that they would be. And Gordon said, no, you can't put up a, a tent because it'll ruin the grass and so forth. Well, they got a tent up there now. <laughs> so somebody figured out a way uh, that uh, you could put it up without uh, ruining uh, the uh, grass. One other, if I may, just take another moment. The, uh, the reference uh, to 42nd Street, both of you have been so nice in your comments about me. I don't want to say this, but you're both ridiculous on that issue. <laughs> and I will explain to you why. 42nd Street, which everybody knows about throughout the world and wants to visit, you couldn't go there without being in physical danger. You, no uh, parent would bring children there. It, uh, every other store was a porno store. Uh, it was deserted at night except for people looking for sex. And what was interesting uh, was that the one block which was uh, the most blighted between 7th and 8th uh, uh, Avenue brought in a total, this is the most well-known section of the city in the entire world, it brought in $5 million in taxes. That's all taxes, real estate, sales, and so forth. And it brings in today, and we were told that when you would do it, we ultimately did. I was the one in whose administration uh, uh, it's the, we commenced the plans, and I'll just another uh, two words on that, that you would ultimately end up with $800 million in taxes. Five million, 800 million. And the places and environment that was uh, totally uh, different. So I think that people in the city should be very proud of 42nd Street. And lastly, the uh, Lindsay administration had a plan for 42nd Street that was uh, approved by the Ford Foundation, and it was a terrible plan. Uh, it had a Ferris wheel on top of a taxpayer building uh, on that uh, block. And uh, when I came in, uh, the uh, chief executive of that uh, particular committee that was in charge, he came in and uh, he said he'd like to go forward. I said, over my dead body, I said, this is ridiculous, a Ferris wheel on 42nd Street? What do you think this is, Disneyland? <laughs> and uh, he said, you're not going to stop us. I said, of course not, so long as you build it with your own money and not the city's. Go ahead. That's ridiculous, he can't. I mean, there's a the city uh, built it. So I'm, I'm very proud of uh, 42nd Street. Well, since I actually, uh, in my defense, I did go there in the 60s and 70s. I often went with someone else. And no offense, Mary, I think you're absolutely wrong. Um, I wasn't mugged. I didn't think it was dangerous. I think cities have to be a variation um, of things. I'm not, as a resident, interested in what kind of tax return uh, the city is getting it was or maybe I just like porno and looking for sex at a very young age um, It was a fantastic if you want to be a writer. That's the place you go You go to places that have more variation than you can ever ever imagine now. I know as mayor uh, It was important to you to increase the tax pace which you did but I would call it Disneyland because it's it's chain stores and it's everything that we've seen before and what makes a city great is uniqueness. Now, New York will always be unique, but you could take Milwaukee, Cleveland, and Kansas City and change them at night and nobody would know. And I think that New York has lost that. I think Soho is so gentrified, it is beyond belief. And yes, a, a good park with less violence and more green is a better 
ballpark, but I think that you do lose a little bit of, of the characters and the funkiness um, that also make New York the best city you know, in the world. And the best thing, what's the best thing about the park? It's a public space. You use it, you use it, you use it. We, we all use it. And if I wrote with nostalgia, I apologize, but I lost touch with that park in 2002 and I can't um, you know, predict the future. But for me, being on Central Park West, that park became mine. That park became my backyard through thick and thin and then thick again. Take a question here. Okay, last question. All of you, in certain ways, to the question that I'm going to ask, you said all of us use it. Do all of us use it? Is it really a racially integrated park? Well, what is racially integrated in America? I mean, that's a very, very difficult question. You talk to, you know, all sorts of studies have been done that's, that racial stratification, particularly among blacks, is as worse as it's ever been. There have been studies done that whites will move into a community that has majority Asian and Latino, but will not move into a community that is, that is all black. Is it racially integrated? Probably not because of where it's situated and the fact that there probably aren't many blacks um, that do live there. Now, why they don't use it, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's a conscious racism on the part uh, of, of, you know, of, of anybody, and I don't frankly know what a city uh, you know, can do about it. When I'm there, I see a lot of different ethnicities. I see a lot of different people, and you know, it's a multicultural world, and I think the park does reflect that. I'll jump in here. There's a sort of canard that is spread by some that there are white parks and black parks and poor parks and rich parks, uh, there is no park that charges admission or has a fence that says you can't come to the park unless you pay. The parks belong to everybody, <clears throat> and particularly with the creation of the bicycle lanes where people can get more easily from park to park. Yeah, that's so. Um, Central Park, of course, is bordered not just by Central Park West on the west, but by Harlem on the north and by East Harlem on the northeast. If you go to the park on a Sunday, you'll see uh, Hispanic softball leagues playing there and little leagues uh, go on any Saturday or Sunday. Picnics coming in from Harlem with enormous families coming in and enjoying the park. And everybody gets to enjoy it a little bit better now because it's cleaner. And the north end of the park in particular has been fixed up. It is spectacular up in the north end of the park. The, there's the new boathouse visitor center there. The lake is all dredged out. The, the um, conservatory garden is, is gorgeous. That's all in the Harlem end. The, the most beautiful park of Central Park, in fact, is in the Harlem end. And um, Morningside Park nearby has also been fixed up. So. Uh, I would say the park, um, yes, the neighborhoods to the south south and east and west have gotten wealthier, but uh, you still have East Harlem and, and Central Harlem there to the north. So it's it's probably as integrated as it's going to be, and this, in fact, the parks of New York were designed to be uh, democratic spaces. That's what Olmsted had in mind, Olmsted and Vox. They very consciously wanted these to be democratic spaces. In their day, they, they were talking not about racial democracy, but about class democracy. Poor people who lived south of 42nd Street where there were no parks would travel to the park, mingle with the rich, and he felt that there was going to be a democratic thing that took place when people of different classes mingled together. In fact, that's still true today. People of all classes, all backgrounds mingle in our parks, which is why I believe that New York City, unlike other cities, is much more ethnically, racially, and economically diverse because of the parks and because of the subways where we all have to be together. And we, we don't actually live in completely central and operate in completely separate enclaves as they do in most other cities. I think that's the final question. I and so. Debbie, do you want to wrap it up? Oh, do you want to just wrap up anything? Uh, I thank you all for coming. The, there were books outside for purchase, and I believe some of the authors <laughs> will stay here and sign them. And I want to thank, it's an honor to serve, to have served with Mayor Koch. And um, what's, there is, what's great for me to, is to be with him again and to have him bring up these recollections um, of when he was mayor that are crystal clear. <laughs> and he remembers things that I don't remember. <laughs> and there's, that's why he is the man he is on radio, on TV, and still practicing. Thank you.